We're going to continue on in our Second Peter series, so let's go to the Lord and Word of Prayer and we'll get into today's message. God, thank you uh, for your word. Thank you for this letter that you inspired Peter to write to those churches in Asia Minor that as applicable as it was for them 2,000 years ago, how much it still applies to us today. God, we find that amazing. And we're humbled by your wisdom and your sovereignty and your goodness in providing this for us. Help us, God, to, to not just hear your word, but to meditate on it and to take it in and to learn from it and to apply it to our lives, to live it out. And as we get into a couple of reminders today, as, uh, as Peter was in nearing the end of his life, and he felt so compelled to remind these disciples that of the truth of who they are in you, the things to warn them against, the, 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 the things to hold strong with, the, the ways to grow spiritually and mature so that the gospel could be carried forth. I pray that we do those same things today. God, we pray that you give us a good day. That your spirit works and moves among us. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so somebody once I saw this quote this week. The only thing faster than the speed of thought is the speed of forgetfulness. Now, I wish I could remember where I read that this week, but it, I just now picked up on the irony of what I just said. Like, literally, I just picked up on The only thing faster than the speed of thought is the speed of forgiveness. Like, if you know me much, you know I can be a little absent-minded. Like, I, we talked, you know, about stuff like knowing stuff, you know, and I, I know a lot of stuff. Like, I'm not particularly smart. Don't, don't, don't misunderstand that, right? There's a big difference between somebody who's smart and somebody who knows a lot of stuff, right? There's a big difference. I'm that guy, right, who knows a lot of stuff. Most of it does me no good. That kind of stuff, somehow I can remember. But stuff like the birthdays of my children and my brothers and sisters and my dad, like those completely escape me. Now don't get me wrong, I, I think I know my kids. I know Aaron's birthday because it's also our wedding anniversary, right? So I gotta I get to double dip on that one, right? And so I, that one's... That one I got. The other two, I know what they are, but I get mixed up. Let's see, Warner's in June and Jacob's in February, but the dates, I can't ever remember which is which, right? Like I, So I kind of know them, but my brother Jason, every time one of our immediate family members, a brother, sister, my dad, somebody close to us, Every time their birthday comes around, he sends me a message or he calls me to say, hey, and don't forget to call her or Facebook or text or something to Melissa or Elizabeth or whoever, right? Because it's their birthday. And I'm like, they have another one of those again already? <laughs> like, I, I'm terrible at that. Now, and, and when, when, I, when I travel, this might be the worst, or go somewhere unfamiliar, right? You park your car in a big parking lot or a big pick, parking garage, or you park at the airport or something, and you're gone for about three days or four days, and you come back. I barely can remember what my car is, much less where it is, right? Like I, you know, and I'm one of the, I'm that guy out there using the, you know, you can do that with your remote, by the way, on your car. If you if you're too far away, you open your. I know it sounds like I'm yanking your chain. I'm not. Oh here, my oh here. And click it, and it'll it'll it extends the. Your head works like an antenna. And the, by the way, mine works really well because apparently the emptier it is, the better <laughs> it works. Okay, for the most part, for the most part, our forgetfulness on things like that, they're pretty inconsequential. Like you might hurt somebody's feelings a little bit, but if you can, if you can make light of it enough, you can get people to laugh at you with it and they forget that their feelings are hurt. Like, most of this kind of forgetfulness is just not very significant, but there are times when we forget things, and it has real implications, and it has serious consequences. 
So if you don't believe me, try preaching a funeral and forgetting the deceased's name. Mm. Listen, I did that. And uh, I typically manuscript. You can come look after the service. I manuscript my messages. I don't read them, but I manuscript them. There's a few reasons. One is to, to it helps me intentional about the words I choose to use. And I have to think through ahead of time and be intentional. But when I do funerals, I manuscript them partly. So I've got that name in there because I forgot early on. Mama's name, or whatever, right? And 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 I was able to. Like, you can really hurt people. And but that's even not. Many of the things that we forget don't really have a lasting impact. But some of the things will last throughout eternity. If we forget, or if we disregard the the things we've been taught about how we should live for the Lord in this life. That will have an eternal impact. Like you're, if you profess to be a disciple of Jesus, you profess to be a follower of Christ, you profess to love the Lord, and you don't live like that is true, that matters. It matters now, and it matters into eternity. There are people that we could have reached that will not be reached because of the way we live our lives. There are rewards that we would have received that we will miss out on. There's spiritual growth that we would have attained that will pass us by. We have to be sure to remember the things that carry the weight of life and death. And I mean that literally, life and death. For Maybe it's for you, maybe it's for that other person, but it, these things matter. Peter, Peter realized the importance for his readers, the, the people, the believers in these churches in Asia Minor that he wrote this letter to. He realized the importance for them to remember the things he had taught them. And, and for some of them, Paul had also taught them. Peter and Paul both led some of the same churches in Asia Minor over the years. And so these are, can you imagine being able to look back and say, well, for a little while my pastor was Paul. And then after that, Peter came around, and like I can't even, it blows my mind, right? But of course, they had no idea what they had, probably, and that just completely went dead. Um, <coughs> it went totally dead, didn't it? That's a battery thing. And the only reason I'm going to do this, the only reason I'm going to do this is because the room sound is what picks up on the camera that's going to go on the YouTubes later. Okay. So, so they, they had. They had these great teachers who had, who had known Jesus and had taught these churches. And so Peter is reminding them of the things they've been taught. And, and we see the importance of this information in the words that Peter wrote in our text today, which is 2 Peter 1, 10 through 15. Now you can turn there, and it's going to be on the screen in a minute. Now think back, if you've been here, Think back about what Peter has written so far. He identified these disciples as fellow followers of Jesus Christ. He, he made it clear to them that, that I follow Jesus, you follow Jesus. He didn't make any distinction. This like faith, he called it. Uh, Peter told them that God's given them these great and precious promises that they can rely on. And, and and that they need, and that God's given them, through, through God's divine power, He's given them everything they need to live a godly life, the life they've been called to live. So He's, he's reminded them of these things already. And then He instructed them to focus their energy on their spiritual growth. He says, your disciples, your followers of Jesus, were working under the assumption that you have faith because that's where you come to know the Lord, right? It's by grace through faith. So we're assuming you have faith. Now add to your faith and he gives them that list of virtues that work their way up to agape love. That sacrificial love that looks a lot like the love God has for us or that Jesus demonstrated for us when he came and died for us. 
And so he instructs them to focus their energy on their spiritual growth because he wants them to be fruitful. He wants them to be effective. He doesn't want them to be nearsighted or blind is how he describes it. So he gives them this list of virtues to pursue to help them achieve that spiritual growth. So we come to verses 10 through 15. And Peter offers some spiritual assurance. And he reinforces the importance of being reminded of these spiritual truths. So let's read that passage. Um, I want to read quick through these as I read. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. I'm going to pause right there because I was very tempted to take this one of two directions, right? We could make this the great Calvinism, Arminianism message. And not that there's not a place for that. And selfishly, that's totally what I wanted to do because I love discussing that. But I really didn't feel like that's where the Lord was taking me. So I'm just going to put a pin in that for now. And we may at some point have some teaching about that because it's important and it's what we believe. Right? And we, we, maybe you don't know it by those names, but that's okay. So therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have. I think it is right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body. Because I know that I will soon put it aside as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And I will make every effort to see that after my departure you will always be able to remember these things. Peter, Peter states that he's going to continue to remind them of these things. Right? That's what verse 12 said, as long as he lives. Now, what's he talking about with these things? What are what are these things? I think these things are those lists of virtues, right? It's those things we just talked about, right? God's given you these great and precious promises. God's given you everything you need to live the life He's called you to live. You need to work on your spiritual maturity, your spiritual growth, and you do that by focusing on these things, that list of virtues that starts with faith and ends with love. So Peter has declared the importance of adding to their faith. So Jesus had revealed to Peter that he was going to die the death of a martyr. And we find that back in the Gospels. In this interaction that Jesus and Peter have that's in some ways very clear, in other ways very cryptic. It's hard to... It's a little... It's, it's heavy, right? It's kind of hard to know what to do with in some ways. And, and so Jesus is already prophesied, he's revealed to Peter that he's going to die this martyr's death it's about 40 years earlier from when Peter's writing this letter. But he knew now, all these years later, he knew that the time is coming. Jesus said that he would die as an old man. Peter's old. And, um, and we don't know. God may have revealed to him in some special, distinct way that he, that he was going to die soon. And so Peter felt this immense desire to remind the church, to remind his brothers and sisters of these things. And his desire was for these truths, for these things he's reminding, for them to remember them long after his life had ended. I, I read where the late Adrian Rogers, a longtime pastor at Bellevue Baptist Church in Memphis, Tennessee, a wonderful gospel preacher, that uh, sometime before he passed away, he wrote a letter to the supporters of his of his radio uh, ministry, Love Worth Finding, publishing and radio and all the other things. So he wrote a letter to them, and, and it was his desire that that ministry continue after he had passed, right? And so here's what he included. He closed the letter with these words. He said, my prayer is that you would continue your support to ensure that God's great love worth finding is proclaimed until Jesus returns. That's the same sentiment Peter makes. Like, I won't be here much longer. This may be the last you hear from me. I may never actually see you again. But these things, 
please remember me. When I'm gone, remember these things. Remember what I've taught you. Remember what you've learned. Uh, you know, it's interesting. A minister of the gospel, a preacher, a pastor, um, really, in the grand scheme, has a relatively short time to work on equipping those who are under his care. Now, in some churches, it's shorter than others, right? I, I feel very blessed to have been here. We, we were talking a little earlier. How long have you been here? I've been 11 years since the summer of 2012. And I feel very blessed that that's the case. Um, I know that a number of churches my dad pastored there, you know, anywhere from two to five years, and and some of them he there was one church he pastored about five years, an old old church, and I think until fairly recently he was the longest serving pastor ever in the history of that church, and that's a sad state of affairs, I think, right? It, that's churches don't have stability, and it's hard to systematically preach and teach the truth and the gospel and to, and to ground people in a short period of time. And so I'm, I'm grateful. And I don't know what the future holds. By the way, I don't have any intention of going anywhere. I like it here. We have a mortgage that we have to pay. We don't want to sell our house. right? Our, we have a grandchild here. I don't want to move. So that don't read anything into any of that, right? This is not... I just As I'm saying it, I realize this may sound like I'm gearing up for something. I am not gearing up for something. I told somebody one time, if you don't want me to do this anymore, I'll be the best church member the next pastor ever had because I'm not leaving. Um, so, but we don't know what the future holds. And the reality is, is we all have an end. Peter did. Peter shared with them that he needed to remind them of some, some things before he went home to meet the Lord again in person. My desire is the same. But whatever the future holds, I hope to, as Peter said, refresh your memory. And God's Word is full of reminders for the disciple of Jesus. And so I want to share two reminders today from this text. The first of those is I want you to remember your very salvation. Last week we saw in verse 9, I won't re-preach last week's message, we saw in last week in verse 9 that, that Peter tells them that basically that a lack of spiritual growth can lead to forgetting that we've been cleansed from our past sins. And he describes that as leaving us spiritually blind. When we, when we live in such a way as quote-unquote Christians, when we live in such a way that we forget that we've been cleansed of our past sins, we are effectively blind. We're blinded by those sins. Verse 10 then, which we read today, reinforces this. And Peter calls us to make every effort to confirm your election, your calling and your election. Now, I want to I say something. and I don't want you to... It's strong, but I don't want you to misunderstand it. I want to be very clear. If your life is not marked by those characteristics that he mentions in verses 5 through 7, right? Faith, perseverance, self-control, etc. If your life is not marked by those things, growing in those areas, there's a real possibility that you have doubts about your own salvation. Like that's a typical... Like if I'm not... If you're not growing in those areas, it's quite likely you don't really feel saved. Now, you may know cognitively you are, right? And I think this is a, a problem because we build a church culture oftentimes that is if you'll walk this aisle, if you'll pray this little prayer, if you'll let me give you in the water, then you're good to go. And it's not that simple. You need to do those things, right? I mean, the walk in the aisle and the words of the prayer, that's how that frames out is, is there's a lot of room. But... but you do need to be, there needs to be a public profession of faith and there needs to be a prayer of repentance and calling on Christ to save you. But those actions in and of themselves don't save you. They should, however, lead to change. They should lead to you doing those things in that list. 
add to your faith these things. And, and so when those things are evidence of our salvation, they're not the cause of our salvation, they're not the thing that makes us saved, they're not even the thing that keeps us saved. We are saved by grace through faith, hard stop. Right? I don't want to imply otherwise, but I do want to make it clear that the result of being saved by grace through faith ought to be the Spirit working and living in you in such a way as to bring out those qualities as you cooperating with the Holy Spirit grow in those areas. That is the evidence of salvation. And when there's no evidence of salvation in your life, assurance of salvation is difficult. And to me, that just seems very logical. Right? If, if I'm not living like a Christian, it seems like it would be natural for me to doubt whether I'm a Christian or not. To wonder. Not only, though, will others question the genuineness of your faith, but you will start to as well. And, and, and I don't want to imply, though, that every time there's a crisis or a question, that that's you know a, a big faith crisis, right? It, it, it's not. I think we've all, from one time or another, had questions about our salvation. God, are you there? Are you even real? Am I even saved? Is this even a thing? Like we, I think we all go through those times from time to time. But Peter wants us to know that if we will add to our faith these qualities that he lists in then we'll be built up not just in our behaviors but built up in the assurance of our salvation it, it's not just about knowing more about God it's about knowing Him more and doing those things growing in those areas helps us to know Him more not just know more about Him I don't know if you've ever talked with people who maybe profess to be Christians but are wondering or doubting. The, the thing that's most striking is the lack of comfort. Right? That, that if, if they have an understanding of what it means to be a Christian and they're wondering if they really are one, they are not comfortable with that. Because if you know what the stakes are, if you really know what's at stake, eternity, peace in this life, being God's, being Jesus' disciple, if you know what's at stake and you're not sure if you're in, that's an uncomfortable place to be, uh, that lack of assurance. But those who have assurance of their salvation were able to live a, the abundant, victorious Christian life that Jesus promised us. And so I, I don't want to. I don't want to assume where any of you are at on that. Right? I I trust that probably all of you would, would profess to me. Yeah, no, I, I definitely I definitely am a Christian. Right? But but I don't get to see you day in and day out in the close relationships of your life. So I'm not going to make any assumptions. Like some of that may describe you. You may be struggling with the assurance of your salvation. And by the way, if that's true, I, I really want to encourage you to come and see me after our worship gathering. I, I want to visit with you about that because the Bible makes it clear you can be confident in your salvation. You can have assurance. I, as, as Arminians, we believe that a person can make shipwreck of their faith. They can, they can trust in Christ, be legitimately saved and then at some point they can walk away from that and turn their back on that and, and be lost again. Now we, we believe that. I have a friend who is a he, he believes very differently on that issue and he said, how do you how do you have any assurance of your salvation? So well it's I mean I, mean, I remember when I got saved um, I read the word I, I, the Holy Spirit lives in me. I mean I, I have the same assurance you have. Like the, our assurance is no different. Just because you have a, a framework that says that God 
from the foundations of the world chose that you would be saved as opposed to your neighbor who he says is not going to be saved and that if you're saved you can never not be I said how do you know you've not just convinced yourself you're one of the elect right you're not really you've just logically convinced yourself right you've learned enough scripture you've you've just talked yourself into I'm one of the elect like how do you how do you have any assurance I think mine is more assured than yours right and he, he's well, have a good day Mr. Collier and so what you know uh, but we can the scripture is clear John writes about it in first John quite a lot about that we can have assurance of our salvation okay I want to move to our second reminder. The second reminder that Peter gives us, so remember your very salvation, right? He tells us to make your election and your calling sure, to, 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 to concentrate and focus on that, confirm that, he says. The second one is to remember your final destination. That's what we see in verse 11. The end of verse 10 and all of verse 11 says, for if you do these things, what are these things? These things are that... Remember those promises that God's given you everything you need. Here's these things, these characteristics you need to focus on building and growing and becoming more spiritually mature. If you'll and, and making uh, uh, confirming your election and and uh, calling. If you'll do these things, you will never stumble, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. One of my great frustrations, and I grew up in our Free Will Baptist churches, and I've attended a number of other, we mentioned in Sunday school, you know, I've, I've visited churches not like us, you know, right? some, some that were, we were too much like them, some independent fundamental Baptists, King James only, et cetera, et cetera. But God bless them, I'm not, that's a whole other conversation. I visited Pentecostal churches, I have a lot of family who in various kinds of Pentecostal churches, like I've, Here's something I've noticed in conservative and fundamental and evangelical churches. Right? For many, many years, one of my great frustrations is that the church talks so much about the Christian's home in heaven that we neglected talking about the life he's called us to in the here and now. And, and, and if I'm honest, I've probably personally overcorrected. Like, I probably talk not a lot about the kingdom to come, about the new heavens and the new earth, like about our view. I probably don't talk enough about that. I've, I talk a lot more about the here and now, right? It's not that I'm opposed to the other. I think it's just sort of an unconscious overcorrection, right? That being said, Peter makes a big deal here about the promise of eternity. And we need to be mindful of that. We need to remember that this is not all there is. I, I was with uh, um, a friend. There was a group playing some music, and they were talking about these old songs, um, old, these old gospel songs. And they were, let's say, there's farther along, and I've got a mansion over the hilltop, and uh, when we all get to heaven, and like those kinds of gospel songs, which, by the way, were all written in a similar kind of time frame. And one of the guys said something about, I don't know why all these songs are, they're all, they're all a lot alike in their themes. And I, I went to them later. I said, here's why. It's because we're so affected by our context, right? Like, we live a pretty good life right now. We're not trying to escape. And so we don't write a lot of songs about the next life, so to speak, right? But, but most of those songs were written in a really hard time of life, leading up to the Depression, right? People needed an escape. They were looking forward to that mansion over the hilltop when you got nothing in this life, right? When we were in El Salvador, right? One of the fastest growing, and this is true in a lot of Latin America and a lot of Africa, the fastest growing um, churches are often those that preach the prosperity gospel, this false gospel of health and wealth. And God's immeasurable blessings in this life, right? And 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 why is that? Well, it's because you go to a culture where people have nothing. Who who would not find that attractive? When when you got people who 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 literally have dirt floors and and you know what are we going to have today? Beans and rice or rice and beans? Right? Like it's 
suddenly the prosperity gospel that sounds pretty tasty and so we need to focus a little bit more on the kingdom to come perhaps Peter says that those who are fruitful can expect a rich welcome that's the how it was translated in the version I used to do, in the international version a rich welcome into the kingdom so here's where that kind of comes from and I know we're running short on time. Here's kind of where that comes from. In the Roman Empire, and that's the context Peter's writing, in the Roman Empire, there was a special honor called a triumph. And this was a ceremonial procession. And, and it was for generals, conquering generals. They'd achieved some great military victory. And, and, and not just any victory. It had to be a major conquest. And um, when the war was over, the general would come back to Rome. They had a special gate for him to come through, and he would be in a special chariot, and he had special clothes down to his special boots with gold and silver and ivory and like all of those things. And he, he had the robe, and it was embroidered, and it was like it's just incredible. It's to honor him for his great victory. On one hand, he would have a laurel, which was an emblem of victory. On the other hand, he'd hold a staff, which was kind of a symbol for the authority that was being given. They would put a crown on his head. He'd make his way through the city in this in this procession. There would, there would be like a blanket of rose petals on the road. Right? I mean, this was an incredible honor for, for a general to have. Included music and singing, they would burn incense, and at the end of this triumph, the honoree would be given a private banquet in his honor. This is what Peter's describing for us. When this life is over, however that looks for us individually, whether whether something happens and I don't live another day, or whether Jesus comes back and we all go see him together, right? When this life is over, Peter says that we will experience a rich welcome home. That we're going to that we're going to enter the, this everlasting kingdom where Jesus reigns forever. That we'll have a spiritual body. We'll be given a robe of white. We'll receive crowns, and the whole purpose of those rewards is to cast them at Jesus' feet. We'll enjoy. The marriage supper of the Lamb, the wedding supper of the Lamb. By the way, I think that's we receive communion. We'll receive communion next week on the first Sunday of the month, and at the end of our ship trip a couple of weeks ago, they, they, we we took communion together and had the great privilege of leading in that. And, and uh, afterwards, somebody said, when Jesus said that He wouldn't do this again until. Till the kingdom, until we were in heaven together. What did he mean by that? I think this is what he means is the marriage supper of the Lamb. I think he's talking about the wedding feast, that that's the, the ultimate final Passover, the ultimate final communion, right? That after that, there's no more symbolism of the body and blood of Christ, that we're there with him in person. I think that's what he meant. In Revelation, in Revelation 17, 14, there's this interesting little verse, and it says that they'll wage war against the Lamb. It's talking about the enemies of God. They'll wage war against the Lamb, but the Lamb will triumph over them because He is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. And with Him, with Him will be His called, chosen, and faithful followers. With Him. Who, who are these glorified saints that... Jesus is going to bring with him. It's us. If we make every effort to confirm our calling and our election, if if we continue in these things and never stumble, like he said, if if we if we grow, if we mature, if we do the things he's called us to do, then we are his called, chosen, and faithful followers. That we get to experience the great triumph. And there's only one reason this is possible. It's because of what Christ did when He was 
born of a virgin, then lived a sinless life, and died a death he did not deserve, and was buried and raised from the dead and ascended to heaven. That's the only reason we get to experience this great triumph, that we get to be welcomed into the kingdom. As unworthy as we are, as unworthy as we are, we get to experience, we are promised, we are assured this rich welcome. What a promise it is. All the things Peter describes in these verses, all of them, from, from when we started at verse 1 through here, all of these things, they work together. But especially today, these, if we remember our salvation, if when we remember our salvation, we're reminded of our destination. When we remember our salvation, we can be confident in our destination. And when we consider our destination, what it should do is motivate us to do the things He's called us to do, to live the life He's called us to live, to live the life He's given us the power to live. When He said that by God's power, He's given us everything we need to live a godly life. So, do you remember the instruction that's been given to you? Do you remember your salvation? Do you remember that you've been cleansed from your past sins? We're going to close in a minute with a word of prayer. Here, here's my challenge to you. Here's my question for you. And I want you to think about this. And if you want to, after we pray, we're going to sing another song. And if you want to talk, if you need to pray together, I, I want you to do that. I want to meet you out there. This is important stuff. Do you, have, you, have you forgotten that you've been cleansed from your past sins? Maybe some of those past sins have crept back in. Maybe they're not as far away as they should be. Today is a great day to address that. Maybe you don't remember your salvation. You can be assured of that today. Maybe you just have questions and doubts. Maybe it's been a rough season. And you're wondering if God's even still there, or if He's real, or what is He doing with me? I'd love to pray with you about like that. Because Peter says that you can rest in the promise of the rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Will you bow your heads with me? God, thank you. Thank you for the promise of your word, the promise of our salvation, the gift of our salvation, <clears throat> and the promise of our eternal home. Help us not only to focus on living for you here and now, but to remember this is the destination and that you did this for us, that you have given it to us, that you have promised it to us. And we only have it because of the gift of your Son. So God, if there's anybody here today who is doubting or questioning, I pray that they would make that right with you. Find their assurance in you. Maybe there's somebody here who has begun to forget about being cleansed from their past sins and those sins have crept back in and taking hold again. I pray that they would let that go, that they would confess that. Rely on you and not be nearsighted or blind, but have the assurance and confidence in their salvation that you desire for us to have. We ask it all in Jesus' name.